For the Continental Army and the Patriot cause in general, 1776 would be a year of dramatic transitions, both geographical and geopolitical. In February, amid the ongoing siege of Boston, General Washington undertook a promising plan to capture the British garrison with the help of newly acquired heavy guns from Fort Ticonderoga. Though the Redcoats would escape capture, they would be forced to set sail for Halifax, where they awaited the arrival of a massive armada ultimately bound for New York. Meanwhile, in Philadelphia, delegates to the Continental Congress prepared a formal declaration announcing the independence of the United States of America from their former mother country. Though seemingly of little consequence at the time of publication, the resulting document proved a political masterstroke that would quickly win the notice and admiration of enlightened readers in America and around the world. We proceed now to this week's readings from Born in Battle. While Southern Patriots were repelling British efforts along the coast of the Carolinas, back in Boston, despite chronic shortages of every needful thing, George Washington had been brooding for some time on his utmost wish, namely the chance to put a final end to the war and restore peace and tranquility so much to be wished for. In mid-February, he called his generals to a council of war and put before them a daring plan. Holding his lines with a skeletal force, he would make a bold and resolute push across the back bay ice and overwhelm the redcoats with speed and surprise. It is said that councils of war never vote for battle. This one would prove no exception, but perhaps not unreasonably. British strength, as it turned out, was higher than Washington thought, and in any case he lacked the powder to sustain the bombardment his generals believed crucial to a successful attack. Washington eventually agreed, admitting that the irksomeness of my situation might have inclined me to put more to the hazard than was consistent with prudence. But if Washington still lacked powder, he did not lack guns. Fifty-nine heavy guns that had ornamented the walls of Fort Ticonderoga were now at his command, all due to the extraordinary work of Henry Knox, his chief of artillery. An unlikely soldier, this very fat but very active young man, in Washington's words, had been a Boston bookseller in peace, and had taught himself the rudiments of the artilleryman's trade from his own books. Washington took an immediate liking to his jubilant personality, and came to respect his energy and ability. Accordingly, he sent him in the dead of winter to Ticonderoga to bring those guns, sixty tons in all, to the gates of Boston. If young Knox was portly, he was not soft. Loading his guns on sledges on the western shore of Lake Champlain, he hauled them by ox power and main strength through the Taconic Mountains and up the rutted tracks of the Berkshires. From first light to last, the column trudged along through terrible snows and more terrible thaws, fetching up at last in Cambridge and presenting Washington with a noble train of artillery. The arrival of these guns may have in part inspired his initial plan to attack across the ice. But as spring drew near and the ice began to break up, Washington thought anew about how to use those guns to best effect. His most nagging anxiety at this point was that Howe might evacuate Boston of his own free will before he could be brought to battle. Signs of an impending movement were unmistakable, the steady gathering of British shipping in the harbor. New York was the likely destination, in which case Washington would find himself on much more perilous ground, forced to defend an island against the masters of the sea. In response, he resolved to destroy the Redcoat Army before that day came, and he believed he knew how to do so. This plan aimed at the high ground on the Dorchester Peninsula, just two miles from Boston. Heavy guns posted here, as Washington wrote, would command a great part of the town and almost the whole harbor. But Washington wanted to do a very great deal more than simply tighten the screws of this siege. Once Americans were dug in on Dorchester Heights, he reasoned, Howe would be compelled by both military necessity and his own sense of honor to come out of his stronghold and attack. 
It was not hard to imagine the heights littered with redcoat dead and wounded, like Breed's Hill last June. But as costly as that battle had been to the regulars, it had been a wasted opportunity for the Americans in Washington's view. As the sun went down on that terrible day, the British were in disordered pursuit of the retreating rebels, strung out and fought out, and acutely vulnerable to counterattack either at Charlestown or elsewhere along the British lines. William Prescott had seen the opportunity at the time and demanded a thousand fresh men from Ward to complete the destruction of Howe's corps, but Ward had seen only chaos and danger. Washington, too, was mindful of the danger now. In a letter to his brother-in-law, Burwell Bassett, he discussed the possibility of having to seek asylum in the Ohio River wilderness in the event of failure here. But if William Howe would oblige him by making a frontal attack on the slopes of Dorchester Heights, Washington would try to finish him off by counterattacking across the water and driving into Boston itself. The stakes were high. Success would take an entire British army off the board. Failure might very well cost him his own. The risk must have given Washington many a restless night, for the plan was complicated. Assuming that Howe would cross to Dorchester in force, and that the high ground there could be held, Washington intended to send 4,000 infantrymen across Back Bay in two divisions. The first would land on Boston Common and push on to the hills beyond, while the second landed just to the south and marched inland also. When these two divisions linked up, they would turn south and drive for the unprotected British rear on Boston Neck. Breaking these lines would open the way for a third division to march into Boston from Roxbury. On the map, at any rate, the British would be overwhelmed. On the battlefield, though, the plan would demand the precise coordination of three different commands, all green and all marching out of sight of one another. It was one thing to put raw recruits behind a sturdy breastwork and expect them to hold their ground, quite another to maneuver them in large bodies under fire. Then, too, while the Redcoats had been sufficiently patient under siege, it was unlikely that they would sit on their hands while 4,000 armed rebels rode slowly across a mile of open water to Boston Common. All Washington had to support this landing were three floating batteries, each mounting a single 12-pounder. Dangerous as it was, this was the plan Washington presented to his council of war, and this time they assented, as Washington said, with cheerfulness and alacrity. The Dorchester part of the plan had been in readiness for some time. This even Howe knew by way of his network of spies, though he was not particularly alarmed. It was, after all, February in New England, and the hills of Dorchester were still frozen. It was inconceivable that the rebels could dig in there. Nor did Washington intend to. For two months the American camp had been cobbling together fascines and chandeliers, a fascine is nothing more than a tightly bound bundle of sticks and a chandelier the frame in which to put them. Yet with them the Americans would be able to fortify ground they could not turn with a spade. Toward the end of February, these crude materials were loaded onto carts and hauled forward to the jumping-off point behind Dorchester Neck. Gunpowder, too, had at last reached the American camp. Not much of it, but enough, Washington believed, to support the movement to the heights. Finally, Washington called in the militia from the surrounding countryside. These would hold his lines while the bulk of his army was taking the battle to the British. On the 27th of February, general orders went out from Washington's Cambridge headquarters. As the season is fast approaching when every man must expect to be drawn into the field of action, it is highly necessary that he should prepare his mind. Two points in particular Washington stressed. First, Theirs was the cause of virtue and mankind. Second, any man who failed that cause would be instantly shot down as an example of cowardice. About midnight on the 2nd of March, Washington opened the ball with a roar, 25 guns on the American left. Hoping to turn Howe's attention away from Dorchester, this fire fell on the Charlestown side of Boston. Boston. 
British guns answered back in a fairly desultory way, and at length the firing died out. The next night, Washington again bombarded from his left, and this time the British ratcheted up their response a notch. But when this bombardment likewise fell silent, Howe remained convinced that Washington had no more aggressive intent than disturbing the sleep of his garrison. On the night of the 4th of March, Washington was as ready as he was going to be. Now the firing exploded along the whole length of the American lines, and the British banged back in full fury. Under the cover of that thunder, Washington's columns were already in motion across the neck and up the slopes of Dorchester Heights. Three thousand men marching with muskets and spades, hundreds of carts loaded with fascines, chandeliers, and tools lumbering and creaking uphill. Among them was Washington, mounted on a fine dark horse. While riflemen kept a wary watch from the moonlit shore, the work on the crest went forward with sweaty haste. By three o'clock, ramparts had been raised on Dorchester's two highest hills and the saddle between. This accomplished, three thousand worn-out men staggered down the slope to their barracks, while two thousand four hundred fresh troops marched up to take their place. First light of the following morning revealed the rebel works to startled sentries across the way. One officer in a flight of fancy supposed it had been the doing of the genie of Aladdin's wonderful lamp. An engineer in a more sober appraisal had to admit that it was a most astonishing night's work, the labor of fifteen or twenty thousand men, he guessed. But as prodigious as the work was, General Howe had no legitimate right to be astonished. The night watch had reported rebel activity on Dorchester, but Howe had gone blithely to bed. He was jolted awake now. Good God, he exclaimed. These fellows have done more work in one night than I could have made my army do in three months. Nor was that the end of the bad news for Howe. Rear Admiral Molyneux Shuldum, who had replaced the ineffectual Admiral Graves, came in to report what Howe already feared. If the Americans got heavy guns on Dorchester Heights, the fleet would not remain in the harbor. Washington had put Howe in a tight place. He could fight or flee. A fight was precisely what Washington hoped for, and it looked for a time that Howe would have to oblige him. After some harmless cannonading of the heights, Howe made ready to attack. Putting 2,500 men and some field pieces onto transports, he sailed his command down to Castle William, just off Dorchester's eastern tip, and waited for the next tide to take them to the peninsula. As Washington watched the transport slide down the bay, his heart must have leapt in elation. Billy Howe was following the script exactly. The next morning he would have to attack up the frozen slope and into the teeth of 2,400 muskets and a half-dozen field pieces. And as soon as the battle was joined here on the right, Washington was ready to drive into Boston with his left. Even now 4,000 men were ready to climb into boats on the Charles River shore and row across Back Bay. In the end, though, the only rowing done on the waters of Boston Harbor was done by Redcoats, and it was not a passage to Dorchester, but back to their Boston barracks. Near sundown on the 5th of March, heavy weather blew in from the south. A hurricane, according to a Boston diarist. Whatever it was, it was a smashing storm, driving snow and hail before it. By the time it blew itself out the next morning, it had scattered or swamped much of Howe's transport and persuaded him to call off his attack. If this was an intensely disappointing anticlimax for Washington, it must have been an immense relief to Howe. He had ordered the attack in the first place only because he believed the honor of the troops demanded it. Driving the rebels from Dorchester Heights would have been bloody business, that was certain, and he must have brooded long and hard on the memory of Bunker Hill. Even if he were able to score another dear-bought victory, it would gain him little more than the right to remain where he was. All that the works on Dorchester Heights had done was force his hand, sending him packing ahead of schedule. Boisterous weather, he later explained to the Earl of Dartmouth, gave the enemy time to improve their works, to bring up their cannon, and to put themselves into such a state of defense I could promise myself little success by attacking them. Wherefore I judged it most advisable to prepare for the evacuation of the town. 
As the weather cleared, Howe's army went to work with frenzied energy, loading guns, gear, and soldiers, as well as many desperate Boston Tories, into Sheldon's waiting ships. An unspoken gentleman's agreement was worked out between Howe and Washington. Washington would allow the Redcoats to sail peaceably away. Howe would not burn the town on his way out. By the 17th of March, Redcoats and refugees alike were gone, laying off Nantasket roads and leaving behind in their confusion all manner of guns, ammunition, supplies, and equipment. To the senior Yankee general Artemis Ward, Washington gave the honor of leading the first troops into the city. Washington himself took no relish in so insubstantial a triumph, but he did try to take it philosophically. The storm that had stalled Billy Howe and spoiled his well-laid plans must be, he supposed, the remarkable interposition of providence, and meant to serve some wise purpose. It was possible that providence had already done Washington very signal service that he did not yet appreciate. While the storm swept away an excellent opportunity to fight on good ground on Dorchester Heights, it also kept Washington from attacking across Back Bay, an attack that might well have cost him four thousand men in one fell swoop and wrecked the army he had been at such pains to build. Montgomery and Arnold had attacked at Quebec in two columns that were likewise supposed to link up. Montgomery's attack was broken in a moment, and Arnold's column was surrounded and overwhelmed all this by Carleton's tiny ragtag garrison. In the face of Howe's drilled and disciplined regulars, the Americans who made it into Boston might never have made it out again. Thus, it was probably just as well for the American cause that Washington was thwarted in his design. Looking ahead, he was already brooding over the likelihood of fighting for possession of New York. When his spies reported that Howe was sailing for Halifax to the north, Washington scoffed at their innocence, certain in his own mind that Howe would move at once to the harbor at the mouth of the Hudson. It turned out that the spies were half right. Howe was headed for Nova Scotia, but only to refit and reorganize. As soon as he got his army in fighting trim once more, he would, as Washington was sure, sail for New York. The morning after the last redcoat left Boston, Five New England regiments and a battery of artillery were on the march westward while Washington grappled with the problem of defending the island of Manhattan. As spring drew on toward summer of the year 1776, more than 50,000 armed men were in motion toward a confrontation in New York. By midsummer, William Howe would command 32,000 troops, supported by the full power of the fleet under his brother Richard. It was the second largest force Britain had ever gathered for an overseas venture. If, as some in London believed, the Ministry had been fighting rebellion by half measures, it would now exert overwhelming force. The Ministers were by no means clear about the strategy the House ought to employ, or how they should cooperate with Carleton in Canada, but they were agreed on their purpose, to crush the rebellion once and for all before the year was out. To confront this host, Washington would gather an army of barely 20,000. Roughly half of these were his regulars, the regiments of the Continental Line. The rest were the militiamen called in, as always, to meet the emergency of the hour, amateur soldiers on temporary assignment. About overall strategy, the Continental Congress was no clearer than King George's government. New York was to be held and the British barred somehow from ascending the Hudson and isolating New England, but how to do so was their commander-in-chief's problem. Congress would supply Washington with such means as they could in the months ahead and pray for success on the battlefield. Meanwhile, they would try to resolve a deeper question. Were they engaging the American people in resistance to misrule or launching a revolution? In Congress, a conservative faction had formed around John Dickinson of Pennsylvania. While the idea of independence was first whispered and then openly debated in Philadelphia, this faction held its own against John Adams and the Radicals. They were not timid men, but by their lights true conservatives, trying to hold on to what they believed to be English liberty and a just relationship to king and empire. 
Even Washington, up to his eyes in war, could not bring himself to call Howe's army the king's troops. They were still the ministerial army. Nor were they unreasonable men. If independence could be achieved at all, it could very well leave them nothing more than thirteen weak, vaguely allied states, suddenly at the mercy of Spanish and French power. But far from Philadelphia, up and down the colonies, a sea change in the mood of the American people was already under way. Only in independence, many were coming to believe, could their liberties be preserved. Redcoats and the hard realities of war had moved some to this conviction. But many more had been persuaded by an incendiary little pamphlet by a newly arrived English exile. The exile was Thomas Paine, and the pamphlet, just forty-seven pages in sum, was titled Common Sense. Paine was not yet forty when he reached American shores in 1774, a dark, unattractive man who carried little with him aside from a long string of petty failures and an abiding bitterness for the inequities of the British system. Such luck as he had enjoyed thus far consisted of his crossing Dr. Franklin's path in London. Franklin saw something in him, urged him to seek a fresh start in the new world, and recommended him to his son-in-law in Philadelphia. By the eve of the Revolution, he had made a fair start, becoming the editor of the Pennsylvania Magazine, at the princely salary of fifty pounds a year. His first response to the opening guns seems to have been chagrin, to have the country set on fire about my ears almost the moment I got into it. But few men thereafter did as much as he to feed that fire. Throughout the fall of seventy-five, he worked on a pamphlet in support of the Patriot cause, part argument, part invective, part propaganda, but at the heart of it was a new vision of society based on the natural rights of man. The voice, too, was new to America, a hard-edged, sloganeering style aimed not at philosophers and statesmen, but common folk. To these, Paine presented on the 10th of January, 1776, the simple facts, plain arguments, and common sense of the American cause. At issue was nothing less than the cause of all mankind. Indeed, not since Noah's flood had mankind seen a fairer chance of shuffling off corrupted government and beginning anew in liberty and justice. The particular corrupted government he had in mind was, of course, that of King George. But Paine swung his axe at the root of monarchy itself. Of more worth is one honest man to society and in the sight of God, he declared, than all the crowned ruffians that ever lived. As for the English monarchy, they could claim no nobler descent than William the Conqueror, a French bastard landing with an armed banditti and establishing himself against the consent of the natives. If his history lesson was flawed, and it was, no matter. He provoked Americans into asking central questions. By what right did George the Third claim a continent across the sea? How did a race of men come into the world so exalted above the rest? Monarchy was, Payne thundered, the most preposterous invention of the devil ever set on foot for the promotion of idolatry. This particular monarch, George III, was no more than a royal brute, set upon a throne by an accident of birth. Indeed, hereditary kingship must run contrary to nature itself, otherwise it would not so frequently turn kingship into ridicule by giving mankind an ass for a lion. Society in every state is a blessing, he explained. But government, even in its best state, is but a necessary evil, in its worst state an intolerable one. This much Paine argued about the nature of man and monarchy. As for the practical relations between Great Britain and the colonies, he posed another question. Had the colonies profited more or lost more from their place in the empire? Here Paine drove two sharp points home. First, American prosperity had been the product of American energy and initiative, not British policy, a point that every farmer and shopkeeper was ready to affirm. Indeed, British mercantile law had thwarted American economic energy and shut Americans out of profitable markets 
all to enrich England, which, of course, was the whole point of the mercantile system. Second, far from affording protection to colonial America, they had embroiled the colonies in destructive foreign wars. Let Britain waive her pretensions to the continent, or the continent throw off her dependence, he proposed, and we should be at peace with France and Spain. It was hard to know whether Paine believed his own rhetoric here, but certainly the Spanish and the French would be eager to see the continent up for grabs once more. If Paine was naive on this point, his readers still saw something reasonable in the way he characterized relations between the mother country and the colonies. It was one thing for a powerful nation to take a small island under its maternal protection, but there was something absurd in supposing a continent to be perpetually governed by an island. All this was in some reasonable, and much of it biting, but it may be that the best of common sense comes when pain leaves argument and invective behind, and soars to visionary heights. We have it in our power to begin the world over again, he wrote. Reconciliation with England was no more than a fallacious dream. Indeed, a great destiny was calling Americans to arms and to independence. Now is the seed-time of continental union, faith, and honor. Time hath found us, time hath found us. O ye that love mankind, ye that dares oppose not only tyranny, but the tyrant, stand forth. Every spot of the old world is overrun with oppression. Freedom hath been hunted round the globe. Europe regards her like a stranger, and England hath given her warning to depart. O oh, receive the fugitive, and prepare in time an asylum for mankind. For Americans steeped in a century of Christian millennialism, Paine struck a rich and ringing major chord. Providence itself was calling this generation to build a new Jerusalem. Common sense was quite simply a stunner. By year's end, some 120,000 copies were in circulation and as many as a million Americans had read it, something like 90 million per today's population. A powerful piece, as Edmund Randolph of Virginia plainly saw, it insinuated itself into the hearts of the people. It also, frankly, terrified some of the delegates in Philadelphia. These by no means shared Paine's belief in the natural goodness of humankind, had no interest in building a utopian asylum and saw in the pamphlet the seeds of anarchy, not continental union. John Adams, himself ambivalent about Paine's tract, wrote probably the most balanced account of it at the time in a letter to his wife Abigail. Sensible men think there are some whims, some sophisms, some artful addresses to superstitious notions, some keen attempts upon the passions, but all agree there is a great deal of good sense delivered in a clear, simple, concise, and nervous style. But his notions and plans of continental government are not much applauded. Indeed, this writer has a better hand in pulling down than in building up. There was no point in overthrowing tyranny, he believed, only to usher in anarchy. But the good sense of Paine's tract gave both the people at large and their delegates in Congress a powerful push forward in precisely the direction Adams wanted to go, independence. Every post and every day, he wrote to James Warren on the 20th of May, rolls in upon us, independence like a torrent. This was overstating the case, and he privately admitted as much. While the four New England colonies and the four southern colonies were ready to act, the five middle colonies were not quite so ripe, though we hoped they are very near it. After a year of fighting, however, they were in fact a good deal further from independence than Adams hoped. Dickinson remained in firm control of the anti-independence Pennsylvania Assembly. In New Jersey, Franklin's own son William remained in the governor's mansion in Perth Amboy, and intended to reconvene the state's assembly by royal authority. New York, under the influence of John Jay and Robert Livingston, was at least as staunch in its loyalism. Almost at the same time that John Adams was writing about the torrent of the independence movement, Maryland's popular assembly voted for a reunion with Great Britain on constitutional principles. In Philadelphia, though, 
Adams was about to get some help with the heavy lifting of the independence effort, first from a friend, then from a foe. The friend and ally was Richard Henry Lee of Virginia. On the 10th of May, he put forward a resolution calling on the 13 states to form new governments and establish new constitutions, in effect throwing the old colonial charters into the dustbin of history. When the resolution actually passed, to the astonishment of the anti-independence men, the Pennsylvania Assembly underwent a palace revolution of its own, and soon Tom Paine was in control there. In New Jersey, William Franklin called the Assembly back to business, but as soon as that call went out, he found himself arrested as an enemy of liberty and sent into exile in Connecticut. About the same time, Adams got unlooked-for help from King George himself, Unassailable evidence reached Congress that the king had contracted with an assortment of German princes for 18,000 troops for American service, 8,000 of which were already in motion to join Howe in New York. To those delegates still waffling, it was another blow. Tolerating redcoats and their Indian allies had been one thing. Mercenaries were quite another. On the 7th of June, the independence men judged that the time was ripe. Richard Henry Lee, following the instructions of the Virginia Assembly, rose and resolved that these united colonies are, and of right ought to be, free and independent states, that they are absolved from all allegiance to the British crown, and that all political connections between them and the state of Great Britain is, and ought to be, totally dissolved. For two days debate was fast and furious. The conservative strategy was to delay until tempers cooled, at length, Edward Rutledge of South Carolina won a three-week postponement of debate on the measure to give the delegates an opportunity to consult their assemblies. In the meantime, though, Congress would appoint a committee to frame a fuller declaration of independence. John Adams of Massachusetts was called, and everyone knew where he stood. Joining him were shrewd, soft-spoken Benjamin Franklin of Pennsylvania, Virginia patriot and trained lawyer Thomas Jefferson, Roger Sherman of Connecticut, no fire-eater but an independence man, and finally Robert Livingston, New York patrician and the only foe of independence on the committee. Drafting the Declaration fell to Thomas Jefferson in part as a matter of practical politics. Franklin, perhaps the logical choice, was a thinker and writer of authentic power, but also the father of a royal governor recently declared an enemy of liberty. Roger Sherman had no particular gifts as a writer, and Livingston could hardly be expected to draft a document he was prepared to repudiate when it came time to vote. John Adams probably had as sound a grasp as anyone of the political issues involved, and not long before had written a pamphlet, Thoughts on Government, giving his views on the framing of new state constitutions. But Adams was also blunt-spoken and abrasive in debate, and sometimes seemed determined to make as many enemies in Congress as he had in Parliament. Indeed, in time to come, he would make a bitter enemy of Jefferson. Nor did Adams have any illusions about himself. Jefferson must write the document, as Adams explained to him with rueful clarity. Reason first, you are a Virginian, and a Virginian ought to appear at the head of this business. Reason second, I am obnoxious, suspected, and unpopular. You are very much otherwise. Reason third, you can write ten times better than I can. And so it fell to Jefferson in one of those happy accidents of history in which the man and the hour are well met. He was just thirty-three that summer, a tall, raw-boned, red-headed Virginia gentleman. He had spoken only rarely in debate. Adams maintained that he never heard him utter three sentences together, and fellow delegates found themselves straining to hear his tinny, high-pitched voice. But they had quickly come to respect Jefferson's energy, ability, and discipline in committee work. What they did not realize, though, was that this reserved young man was about to become the conceiving spirit of the American nation. <laughs> 